Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Go ahead and let uh, some of the older kids go out if they didn't get a chance. And welcome to the gathering of the church. So glad that you're here. And um, glad that we could share some blessings, some burdens uh, with each other. Um, Sometimes that's hard to do. Um, But we're a family, and so we want to bear each other's burdens. We want to be a blessing to each other. I'm glad this isn't our only interaction with one another. Uh, but I'm thankful for this one, to be able to come together and, and to sing together and to hear God's word together and to just be still. How many are thankful for a few moments to just sit and be still? That's nice, right? Um, and, you know, you don't get that opportunity when you go to work too much and you don't get that opportunity when you go to too many other environments, but sometimes it's just good to be still and to be together and, and to, to be reminded as Pastor Brian mentioned, through the songs of how great our God is, and then through his word, how faithful he is to us and the promises that he's given to us. We're in the book of Micah. We've been going through the book together. We're in chapter 4 this morning. If you want to catch up and uh, begin to read the book, uh, we're not too far ahead, um, but I would encourage you uh, just to get into chapter 4 and to start to read that. We're going to look at the first five verses today. I'm going to read that with you today as you look at it. Uh, there, I hope you have uh, your, your Bible with you uh, in some form that you can look at and see the Word of God, allow it to have an effect, and, and um, hide God's Word in your heart today. Um, I would say this, when we hear God's Word, sometimes it may not be exactly for a season that we're in. Sometimes it's for, you know, healing from a season we came through, or it might be currently for what we're facing, or it might be preparation for what we may be going through. And um, I would say uh, with the Bible, it's so much better for us to be proactive than reactive, to have it prepared and hidden in our hearts and ready and decisions already made before we ever get to the presentation of whatever that decision is, that we've already made our decision to follow Jesus and, and uh, dwelt on uh, his faithfulness to us. As we're progressing through the book of Micah, Micah 4 um, brings us to uh, just a, a hopeful shifting of gears, and if you've been going through this and heard some of the sermons, you might say, oh, thank God, finally hope, all right? Uh, We've been going through a lot of things. We've talked about idolatry and the abuse of power and and, uh, oppression and some heavy uh, topics, including also looking at ourselves and seeing how we may be part of that, maybe even subtly, if not overtly, uh, in our own lives, and and I think it's good for us to examine ourselves, And, and, and there almost seems to be in the first three chapters, uh, a lack of hope. And, and I, I would say this, um, when we look at God, we, we know that even though they were going through these difficulties, we know he was still present with his people. And so uh, sometimes we lack hope in our own lives. And can I say, even if you're lacking hope, cling to the promise that he's still with you. Even if it doesn't seem very hopeful and the circumstances are not uh, reminding you so much of hope and help and restoration, but just the fact that he's still speaking, even if that voice is corrective in nature or instructive in nature, um, we need the correction, we need the rebuke, we need the conviction in our lives, especially when we've gone astray. And then to be reminded that who God loves, he corrects. So if you're being corrected by God, it's because he loves you. And I think sometimes while we don't like correction and often have to endure it, um, it's good that we have Uh, a father who loves us enough to tell us when we're going astray in our lives. And as God is dealing with the people of Israel um, in kind of the present of the writing um, with the issues that they're facing, and in the process of dealing with their idolatrous actions, with the injustice all around them, with the oppression, with the abuse of power uh, that they had caused. And we've seen that in a way, um, the book of Micah reflects Uh, human experience because human hearts are in the grip of idolatry. We've all had the tendency in our lives to be unjust. Our lives are marked by the misuse of power um, and privilege and by us using our power to to just get personal gain. It's the world that we live in. It's the encouragement we have. Use the power that you have to get your for yourself. Look out for number one and even at the expense of harming other people. And rather than leveraging that power in order to help others and, and, and to be beneficial to others. And, and I think it, it is a challenge to find hope in the midst of all of that. Um, 
If you're looking for problems, how many know that it's not too far to, to find them? You know, we can find them. Um, how many know that if we start listing problems, uh, it won't be too, 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 too hard for us to do that even as we look around the room, right? Um, we all have our own problems, and then we all uniquely are gifted, right, to see problems in other people's lives as well. We have that gift, you know, where we can, you know, poke that out and sense that and see that. Sometimes we're more blind to our own, our own problems than we are to other people's. Sometimes we're less gracious with the other people's sins than we are with our own. Um, and sometimes, again, it's, it's a challenge in our circumstance, especially when the circumstances we find ourselves are especially trying. Um, I think some of you, uh, I'm glad it's not a competition because some of you would be beating me uh, in the area of being faithful through trials. Uh, I know some of you are going through some very heavy things or have gone through some very heavy things. And I want to say this, thank you for continuing to follow Christ through that, even if that's been stumbling through it and tripping and falling through it. But you just keep getting up. And, you know, God says a just man falls, but he gets up again. And uh, he says seven times in, in reference to just completion and maturity, but I think that he's not saying that after seven you don't get up again. He's inferring to us, that implying to us that we just keep getting up. Just like when he said 70 times seven we forgive. He's not saying that at the end of 490 forgivings we, we give up. You like how I did that math real quick? All right, but the, um, I did it ahead of time. But uh, the... Um, He's not, say, he, he's not saying give up on your forgiving. Uh, he's saying just keep forgiving, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. And uh, how many are thankful for the faithfulness of the Father to us? And uh, I keep failing and falling and struggling. He just keeps being faithful and present and, and perfect and, and loving and, and uh, just keeps sowing uh, peace and blessing and uh, his desires for me and over me, and uh, he's such a, a good father uh, in that way. But as we look at this book, where is hope? Where is restoration? We've been talking a lot about justice and a little bit about hope. And we, if you remember, had said that restoration and hope is coming, but it's coming through rebuke. So it's coming through uh, correction. That first, there has to be that rebuke, and then the restoration can come. Is there realistic hope for our world, um, our world that we live in, that extends beyond our own individual, individualistic dreams and, and comforts and, and respect and security and so on? Is there any hope that our world will, will start spinning in the right direction? It seems like it's been spinning in the wrong direction for a long time. And uh, is there hope um, or are we bound to destroy ourselves and one another forever? It seems like um, it's not too long at some sense of peace that we feel in our world where uh, just people start hating each other and hurting each other and fighting each other again. And the Bible argues to us and tells us that this cosmic hope that we long for, that we desire so much in our hearts, that it does exist. It, it does exist. But where is the source? And I want you to look at chapter 4 with me because remember, Mike is a prophet. And while he was forthtelling, in other words, telling the people what God said for him to tell them was happening presently, um, there's a twofold uh, position in the Old Testament for the prophets. There was also a foretelling where he was going to tell them something that was yet to come and something that was yet to come to pass. And this is what he begins to do. And notice his reference, he says, but in the last days... That conjunction, but just tells us there's going to be a turn of, uh, the, the, the chapter takes us in a different direction away from all this difficulty and oppression and idolatry and abuse of power into this, this promise that in the last days it, it shall come to pass. That's something that we should cling to, those words, that it will happen. It's going to come to pass. That the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come up and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, 
and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths, for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the words of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid, for the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. For all people will walk, every one, in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. So in chapter 4, we find here in the midst of all the chaos that's been described in these first three chapters, that God injects this vision, this foretelling from the prophet of astounding hope. He gives a promise of restoration. He gives a picture of restoration. And as we look into the New Testament, we see the experience of that restoration coming to pass. But first, it happens uh, here as he describes in the text that we just read on the mountain. It happens on this mountain. And as he's speaking of restoration, he gives this picture of a mountain. And he's telling us that restoration is found in God's presence and in God's rule. Don't get hung up on the word mountain, but there's a particular reason why he uses uh, this illustration of a mountain and when we think about mountains ourselves, I've seen, how many have seen some awesome mountains? We have some awesome ones in our country. Um, there are many in different parts of the world that are just astounding to look at and to experience. I'm always in awe. But when he gives this, this picture, a lot of times for us, we, th- we think of majesty. We think of something that's enormous and something that's very beautiful in its scale. But when the Bible talks about mountains, it's not just a geographic reference or a beautiful image. There are deep theological implications for what the biblical writers are intending to say when they make reference to a mountain. Um, If you think about Jesus and his discussion with the, the, the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, they had some discussions about worship and he talked about worshiping in this mountain or in Jerusalem and 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 really her understanding of worship, the Samaritans had made their own place of worship in that mountain. And uh, he was referencing that, but he's also referencing the place of worship where the Jews worshiped in Jerusalem and then in the temple. But Jesus said, there's going to be a time where we neither worship there or here, but that God seeking people to worship him in spirit and in truth, and that that worship is going to take place in their hearts as they become the place where God resides and the place that he dwells in. And that worship will again be in spirit and in truth. But what is the intention here? In the text, there's hints to it so that we can pay attention to why he's referencing or what he's intending to say when he makes reference to a mountain. Uh, For example, when we see Mount Sinai in the Bible, how many remember that is where God gave the law? Um, So there's a significance to it. We understand that that mountains are where God's rule is established. Uh, Here in Micah 4, there's a reference to Mount Zion. That's the mountain on the side of which Jerusalem uh, had been built. Uh, It's the mount that the Bible references as the mount of God uh, in the future, uh, where God dwells in the midst of his people. And mountains are where God rules and where God dwells. So when there's a reference to the mountain of God, you have both the rule and the dwelling place of God. We also see this in verse 2. Notice he equates the mountain of the Lord with the house of God of Jacob. Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And when we read of the house of God, we, we need to think of the temple of God. If you remember, it's located in Jerusalem on Mount Zion, which is to the Israelites, that is the dwelling place of the Most High God. And how do we know that this is what Mike is emphasizing? Because he uses this kind of parallel structure in order to emphasize in verse 2. He Notice he says, For out of Zion 
he says, is going to go forth the law. The word of the Lord is going to go forth out of Jerusalem. And, and often when poets or writers want to emphasize something, they use these parallel structures. They use different words referring to the same things. And this is an illustration to point to something about God that's going to bring restoration to pass. It's the, it's, it's the presence of God and the reign of God, the rule of God. When God is present and in control, there will be restoration. Boy, that's something for us to remember. It comes, the, the restoration comes at the presence of God and the rule of God. Isn't it interesting in our own lives that restoration takes place when we submit to God's rule, when we acknowledge God's presence? Um, when I'm sinning, I don't know about you, but when I'm sinning, I'm not thinking about the presence of God. How about you? A lot of times we think God's too busy to be paying attention to what I'm doing at this point. We think there are no eyes on us or we're not practicing the presence of God. Usually it's when we're in trouble and we need help that all of a sudden we acknowledge the presence of God. Oh God, I need your presence, I need you here. And God's like, you need me here, I've never not been here, I'm always here. You know, it's, it's practicing the presence of God that we need to get better at, acknowledging the fact that he's always with us, that he never leaves us or forsakes us, no matter what's going on in our lives, no matter what we're doing or not doing, God is always present and he's always with us. But it's in acknowledging that presence that restoration begins to take place. It's in also submitting to his rule, because as he's talking about these mountains, where the law is given, where the presence of God is, where God is saying, I'm the ruler, I'm the controller, I'm sovereign over, and that he's Lord. Uh, how many know this, that, that he's your savior, but he's, he's, he's supposed to be Lord of your life? They say if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. In other words, Lord doesn't mean just having some compartmentalized area of your life that you give to God. It means that all of your life is controlled and given to God. And I understand that it's done imperfectly now as we're being sanctified and we're not yet glorified, but yet we're still all constantly needing to be submitting to the leadership, to the rule of the Father. He's the one that we need to be ruler. He's the one that we need to be reigning in our hearts first, which is the temple, right? Right? It is the place where God dwells, and it is the place where God rules. It is not that place supposed to be our hearts today. The place where he dwells and the place where he rules. When I'm not acknowledging God's presence, and when I'm not allowing him to be Lord, when I'm not submitted to him in my heart, but I'm yet seeking out to do my own will, boy, restoration is not possible. Restoration can't happen until I'm submitted to him. I can't even overcome the enemy until the Bible says, submit yourself therefore to God and then resist the devil and he will flee from you. Until I'm under God's authority, I am not safe. Uh, until I'm under God's authority, I I'm not secure. Being under God's authority means under his protection, under his care, under his provision. It's not just that we're, oh, we lose everything. We lose all autonomy in our lives. No, God gives us still the ability to, to have a will and to choose, but he gives us the power to choose his will over ours. He gives us the strength to submit to what his desires are for us and to trust that they're far better than anything we could even think of or imagine, that God's will is what he desires for us. And here Micah inverts that parallel structure. He, he mentions the places before he speaks about what happens there in order to provide a greater emphasis for us as we study the, the chapter. The point is that the emphasis is on both where God dwells and where he rules. And we're being asked here to think ab about both the law and the word of God. And Micah is saying to us that if you want to know anything about the promise of restoration... You need to understand it in terms of God's mountain, the place where he dwells, the place where he rules. The promise of restoration involves both his presence and his rule, and God promises to come to his people, and in doing so, he's going to make everything right. Boy, when he shows up, he makes all things right. Man, if things are not right between you and God today, they can be quickly made right. Isn't that the wonderful thing about him? They can be quickly made right. Not because you're good at making things right, 
but because he is an expert at making things right. He can make things right. Uh, We confess our sins because he's faithful and just. Because of Jesus, to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, you can be right with God today, even if you came into the gathering today. You don't need to do it in the gathering, but I would say this to you. If you came in and you know there's something between you and God, and you know you're not in a right position with God, boy, this would be a wonderful time for you to say, God, I acknowledge your presence, and I submit to your rule. God, please restore to me. You remember when David sinned against God? What did he cry out? Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. But before restoration came, he said, Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. He says, Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. An acknowledgement of where we've gone wrong. A cry out to the God who can bring forgiveness to us and restoration to us, a faith that he is able to make things right in our lives. Boy, that brings hope to our hearts, doesn't it? That restoration can come, but not without his presence and not without his rule. The second uh, point, um, I'm sorry, I didn't put that up for, for you, but in case you haven't picked it up already, in scriptures, mountains are that symbol. But hope is, is found through faith in God's word. That's the second thing I want to look at. Hope is found through faith in God's word. As we progress through these five verses, as we're looking through them and we read them, we looked at the mountain of God, but then our eyes are drawn to the one who's calling or making the promises, the promise maker himself. And we we, we might think as we read something like this, this is just some pie in the sky, impossible promise. But every promise, every promise is dependent on the promise maker. Every promise is dependent on the promise maker. How many of you, you've made a promise, you don't have to raise your hand, but you've made a promise and you didn't keep that promise? Anybody with me this morning? You've made a promise and you haven't kept that promise. You, 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 you promised something and you, didn't, you failed to act. How many have ever been promised and had someone that failed to keep their word? So the promises that we both give and receive are dependent on the person that's giving. They're dependent on the promise maker and upon whether or not they are trustworthy to carry out that promise. Somebody can make a promise, but the only way you know whether that promise is going to be kept is in the midst of all oppression and injustice, is to know the promise maker, to know whether or not, whether it seems like it's going to come to pass or not, whether it seems like that promise is being fulfilled or not, that the person making the promise is trustworthy. Notice the promise given here in Micah is, is, is similar language to what we find in Zephaniah chapter 3. Zephaniah uh, said, Sing, daughter of Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all of your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He's turned back your enemies from you. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. He, He tells them that never again will they have to fear any harm. And on that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. This is a promise that injects a vision of hope. Uh, A writer, Ed Welch, put it this way, and I like how he said this in his book, Running Scared. Nothing delightful about ourselves is being described here. Nothing to sing about, and at this point, this is not about us, it's about God. He is the one who takes away our punishment. He is the one who who gives us new hearts. His singing comes from the work that he has done for us in restoring us, and God simply asks for us to come to him with nothing. You know, how many glad that God's promises are not dependent on your performances? God's promises are not dependent on your performances. Sometimes wrongly in our Christian life, we place the trustworthy of God on our own performance. So because we fail, we think God will fail. 
So we think because we've fallen, listen, it doesn't matter how many times you fail God, God will never fail you. It doesn't matter how many, God is not uh, vindictive in a sense of, oh, because you haven't done for me, I'll not do for you. God, God fulfills His promises to us regardless our, of our performance. And what that should do for us is cause us to love Him. Cause us to increase in our love, to increase in our faith, to know that even when we fall and fail, He will never abandon His word. He will never abandon His promises to us. Though we have been a cheating and unfaithful spouse to Him, He will never cheat on us. His response to our infidelity is not to be unfaithful to us. His response to our infidelity is to love us more, to forgive us more, to restore us back to Himself, to take us back into His arms, to never leave us, to never turn His back on us. That is not how we respond to unfaithfulness to us. When someone's been unfaithful to to us, we justify our unfaithfulness. We believe that when someone doesn't keep their word to us, it is a license for us not to keep our word to them. But that's not the gospel, is it? That's not what God says to us. And as a matter of fact, when people are unfaithful to us, when people are unloving to us, when people are unjust unjust to us, God doesn't say, oh, wait till it's fair, then be good to them. When they do good to you, do good to them. He says, Jesus said to, to those people, What gratitude, what thanks uh, should be given to you if you love those that love you, if you're good to those that are good to you? It's when people hurt you, when people are unfaithful to you and you still continue to be faithful because your faithfulness is not predicated on their faithfulness. It's not hanging on their faithfulness. It is because of God that we can be faithful. We're not faithful because of the performance of others, just like God is not faithful because of our performance. The faithfulness we should have should hang on God's nature and on His Word. And so as we continue to be faithful, let it not be because people have been faithful to us or because people have been kind to us. Listen, I'm all with you. We should be, especially to those of the house of faith, we should be kind, loving, and considerate. But here's the truth. When we're not, That is no excuse for us to continue to excuse our unfaithfulness to each other. Wherefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. Continue to be faithful despite the response, because that's what God does. See, God is the the promise maker and the promise keeper, and he desires for us to be people also of his word. Not necessarily people of our word, but people of his word. Keep his word. Follow his word. Do what his word says. Boy, I've been unfaithful to my own word, but I want to remain faithful to his. I want his word to be my word. I want his faithfulness to be my faithfulness. Not the faithfulness I know how to do, but the faithfulness that I've seen in him that have experienced in Him. And this is that promise. Come, He says in verse 2, let's go up into the mountain. What is God through Micah asking us? He's not asking us to bring to Him something we don't have, but to come into what He has, into His presence, and into what He's done for us. God is not asking us to come to bring something to Him. He's asking for us to come to Him and receive what He has for us. Come bring nothing. Don't don't bring anything. Come empty-handed so I can fill you, so I can provide for you. In Jeremiah 31, he says, This is the covenant promise that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, the Lord declared to them, I will put my law within them. He says, I'm going to write it on their hearts. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. How many glad for God's ability to choose to forget our sin? To forget it. He chooses to do so. He doesn't have to do that, but he chooses because he's reminding us that that's what forgiveness truly is. Forgiveness is not separation from the one that hurt me. Forgiveness is choosing not to remember what they've done to me 
and still sitting with them at the table in fellowship. Wow. That's tough, isn't it? It's a lot easier to say, I forgive you, I just don't ever want to see you again. That's how we handle people. We, we say, I forgive, but I can't be around you. God says, I forgive you and I'll never leave you. I want you at the table with me. I want you to fellowship. If, if you can see that perfect picture in Jesus before he goes to the cross with his own disciples as he dips in fellowship into the sop with the one who's already betrayed him. And he calls him friend. As the one who betrays him brings the soldiers to arrest him. And he calls him friend. And he receives him close and embraces him. As he looks at Peter, Peter who thinks, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, who can't keep his promise to God, but denies him and curses him and leaves him and tries to save himself. And what does Jesus come back to do? Make a fire, make a fish and sit down and call Peter back into the calling that he's called him. Peter, come back. I love you. Do you love me? I'm faithful to you. Will you be faithful to me? Will you be faithful to follow me? Boy, we see that faithfulness produced as Peter's heart is transformed, as Jesus predicted. When you're converted, you're going to strengthen the brethren. You're going to be somebody that stands faithful as I've been faithful to you because the faithfulness of God transforms us. The difference between this promise maker and ourselves and our children, just like Israel and their children as promise makers, is that when God makes promises to us, it's not because He's done something wrong, but because we have done something wrong. Think about it. When someone makes a promise to us, it's, it's often because they've hurt us or wronged us, and they'll say, I promise I'll never do that again. I promise I'll make it up to you. We hear from our children, I promise I'll be good. I I won't do that again. I won't ever do that again. And we make those promises, and how many we found? We can't be good. There's none of us that have done good, not a single one of us. We can't even keep our word, even our best intentions, often sometimes. And so we're, we're forced either into performance that's not accurate in hypocrisy or to look for a promise maker whose word can abide in us, and, and, and can keep us when we don't keep our own words. But notice, when God promises, He's not doing it because He's done something wrong, but because we've done something wrong. His past performance does not indicate the promise might not be kept. How many, uh, when you've seen your children say, I'll, I'll never do that again, you say, well, based on your past performance, I'm pretty sure you'll probably do something like this again, or the same thing. How many glad that God doesn't say that to you and me this morning? Have you ever confessed the sin to God that you've said to Him you'd never do again? Sometimes repentance is hard, isn't it? Because even sometimes we believe we've repented and then we return. And God doesn't mean for us to be stuck in confession. He desires to produce repentance in us. The Bible says that he does it through his goodness and through sorrow. Uh, The goodness of God leads us to repentance. Godly sorrow works repentance in our lives. And sometimes God allows us to see our failures so that we won't trust in ourselves, but we'll trust in him. God doesn't forgive you because you've been able to keep your word. He forgives you because he never, never, never breaks his word. That's why he forgives us. That's why you can come today and listen unashamedly, I know the guilt and the shame that comes when we repeat uh, the things that we said we've never returned to. That's not, a, that's not an excuse for us to create grace into some license to sin, that we could continue in sin, that God's grace, as Paul said, would, would continue in our lives, that we have this, uh, this, this ticket where we can just keep doing wrong, but rather that we can actually understand why God is the way that he is because his desire is to make us like himself, to transform us into his image and likeness. And that when we say, should we continue in these sins, church? Can we say like Paul, oh God, forbid. We don't want to, we don't want to continue in these sins that grace may abound. God, help us to, to lay aside the sins and the weights that are besetting us. There's a reason why we've, from those verses, created terms within the church called besetting sins, right? 
the sins that easily lay us aside. It's the sins that we easily trip up. How many, there's one or two of those or maybe more of those that you seem like, God, how many years is it going to be before I get the victory over this? Sometimes I remind myself that the desire to do something that's sinful is never something that's going to leave me. It's, it's, not, it's not something that is going to be removed from me in a sense of there's always going to be this draw. As the Bible says, a man is drawn away, drawn away of his own lust and enticed. There's always going to be this draw in our lives to our own desires, to our own will, to do what our flesh desires to do. And it's not that we're ever going to have that eliminated until, until this, this mortal puts on immortality. That's the only time. That's what Paul was talking about in Romans 6 as he articulated his own struggles. He said, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I shouldn't do, I do. He's like, who's going to save me? Who's going to rescue me from this body of death? And then he declares what? Thank God that salvation is in Jesus Christ. Thank God that he's going to one day Make me like him, that he's going to give me the victory. That's what he says. He's speaking not of temporal victory. Sometimes we have short-term victory in our Christian lives. He's talking about one day complete vindication, complete victory, that our victory truly is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we say thanks be to God who gives, gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so the hope and the promise of God is not unreasonable first because of his character and second because of his power because he is a trustworthy promise maker. And then lastly this morning, there's this picture of restoration that he's giving us through this, these five verses in this text. But notice, peace is found when we are fully satisfied in him. Peace is found when we are fully satisfied in him. Satisfaction is something we all desire, but rarely experience. It's, a, it's, it's something that we cannot experience apart from Jesus. This, again, was in the conversation with the woman at the well, and Jesus said, if you drink of the water that I have to offer you, you will never thirst. He talks about complete satisfaction in him. He was not promising her or offering to her physical water to where she would be thirsty again for. He was offering her spiritual satisfaction. And he was saying that if you drink of the water that I have to offer, if you will take, you have been unsatisfied. He's, he says, you, you've been with five men, five husbands, and, and the man that you're, you're, you're with right now because of her poor reputation, she comes to the well at, at the middle of the day, the hottest point of the day, not when women would often go out to draw in the cool of the day in the morning. She comes alone. She's not with other women. Why? Because she has poor reputation. She's ashamed. She's coming. She's expecting no one to be there. She's astonished when there's a Jewish man there, and she's further astonished when that man speaks to her because she even says to him, Jews don't talk to Samaritans, and Samaritans don't talk to Jews. Why are you even here? What are you even doing? And Jesus says to her, I know why you're here. I know what you're doing. I know your motivations. I, I know your needs, and I'm here for you. Boy, aren't you glad for that moment when Christ said that to you? When he met you, when you were trying to avoid, when you were trying to get away, when you were trying to, you know, kind of just deal with all the situations in your life that have embarrassed you when perhaps your reputation was not very good, perhaps you burned a lot of bridges in your life, perhaps you have a lot of shame and a lot of guilt and, and a lot of things that you're not proud of that you've done in your life. But I tell you that Jesus is waiting to meet you where you are and that Jesus is ready to satisfy all the deep needs of your heart in a way that you never dreamed or imagined and that perfect satisfaction is found in the purpose, perfect promise maker and keeper. The one who never leaves us or forsakes us. He's saying, I'll be the faithful spouse, even though you've been an unfaithful spouse. 
I'll be what satisfies your thirst even though you've looked for love, you've looked for acceptance, you've looked for completion, you've looked for hope in all of these places and in the world you've been disappointed again and again in religions, you've been disappointed again and again in partners, you've been disappointed again and again, but you will never be disappointed in me, he says. He says, will you take what I have to offer you? Friend, you know what he has to offer you? Salvation, restoration, peace. Boy, peace is something that we want, isn't it? We'll medicate for peace. We'll therapy for peace. We'll stretch for peace. We'll exercise for peace. We'll build man caves and she sheds for peace. We'll find places to hide. We will do for peace almost anything. We want peace. We want people to leave us alone. We, we, we look for peace. We just need rest. And Jesus says, come to me, all ye that are without peace, all you that are tired, all you that are worn out, all you that have, have failed to find the peace that you need, come to me. I will give you rest, he says. And the kind of peace that he offers, remember, it's a peace that passes all understanding that will keep your heart and mind. It is not a peace that says, oh, I have peace when there is no trouble in my life. Peace is not the absence of trouble. It is the presence of God. It is God present in your troubles. It is God present in your trials. It is peace in the middle of storms. It is peace in the middle of persecution. It's being able to be at peace when no one else can have peace. It's perplexing when people see a child of God in the middle of circumstances that should overwhelm them and just have peace. Anybody can have peace when they're left alone. But what about peace when the storm rages? What about peace when the problems enter in? That's the kind of peace that he offers to us. He is our peace. He is peace. And he says to us, in Micah 4, he gives this picture of rep uh, restoration. In Micah 1, we're told that human hearts are twisted by idolatry. Because when our hearts, what happens when our hearts are drawn to other objects of affection and value and worship? Well, we experience worry and we have anxieties and we despair and there's hopelessness and we've misplaced hopes and other things and we desire to be set free. How many desire like me to be set free from the slavery of fear? but we lack the means to set ourselves free. We cannot unshackle ourselves. What is this picture of rest restoration in response to this? Micah promises in verse 2 of chapter 4 that many nations shall come. What are they going to say? Come, let's go up into the mountain of the Lord. Let's go to the house of the God of Jacob. Let us let him teach us his ways. Let us walk in his paths. He says, out of Zion, this law is going to go forth, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In other words, where the people used to be compelled by idols. Can you remember chapter 1? What was going on in the mountains and the high places? Idolatrous worship. What's he saying? He's saying restoration, where those false gods were, where they worshipped at counterfeit shrines on other mountains and in other uh, high places, the people have now been brought close to God. God will, he promises, dwell among them and they will walk in his way. In Micah 2, we saw that all human beings are damaged by oppression and violence and war and injustice and racism and sexism and so on. We desire an end to all the bloodshed and all the terror and what is this picture of restoration in response to this? Well, it comes in like a 4-3. Notice he's going to judge between all these people. He's going to decide the disputes for these nations that are far away. They're going to beat their swords into, what does he say, to plowshares. Their spears into these pruning hooks. Nations not going to lift up sword against nation. They're not going to learn war anymore. Many people and strong nations far away are going to be brought together, God will bring justice. 
Swords are going to be turned into garden uh, tools. In other words, instruments of violence will become instruments of the vineyard. And what was once used to destroy and bring death will now be used to plant and sustain life. That which was a picture and symbol of death will be renewed and restored to produce the reality of life. There will be no need anymore for conflict. There will be no more need for tears. He's going to wipe them all away. There will be no desire to learn any more of war or violence. The reason why the prophet is saying this to us is because of this. How many know that sometimes what we desire as the church can be just a little bit a misunderstanding of God's final plan for us? What we often desire is that God would evacuate His people. Get the people of God out of the wicked places. God, get us out of this wicked world. God, get us out of these wicked cities. God, help us all. Let's, let's all find some compound where we all vote the same and love the same things and live the same ways. We cry out for evacuation, and God says, no, no, no. My plan is not evacuation. My plan is restoration. That's my plan. That's God's solution for injustice and oppression and idolatry and the misuse of power. It's not to evacuate His people from those experiences. When we think about restoration and even the new heavens and the new earth as the place of ultimate and eternal restoration, we need to realize that it's not like God just takes us away and brings us into some far-off location never to return. No, He renews the old earth into a new earth. It's a restoration. It's a renewal. It's a renovation of everything we know. Heaven comes down. Heaven comes down. The kingdom of God comes here. Boy, one day God's rule, God's reign will be on this earth. And all of His enemies, all of the enemies under His feet. No more war. See, sometimes we got it all wrong. We think of it in that terms theologically, and that's why often church, our solution to the problems of this world are insulation and evacuation instead of restoration. You know what we need? We need to trust that God can make all things new. We need to trust that God can make all things new. Can God restore a wicked heart and make it whole? Can God take broken relationships and put them back together? Can God take uh, places of war and make them places of peace? Can God turn graves into gardens? Can God bring hope to hopelessness? Absolutely. So we as His people are meant to be restorative in our desire. Everywhere we go, ye which are spiritual, restore, God says. Because people that are spiritual, God is a spirit. We're like Him. That's what God does. He takes things that are bad and He makes them good. He takes things that are dead and He makes them alive. He th takes things that are hopeless and He brings hope to them. And so church, everywhere we go where we sense injustice and oppression and all the things that are terrible in our world, may we as beacons of hope be ready to give an answer of the hope that's within us with meekness and fear. And instead of evacuating from every wicked place in our world, let us stand faithful to God and say, God can make this place new. God will make this place new. Either it will happen in our lifetime or it will happen when He returns, but we can see it happening and trust Him, the promise maker who keeps His promises that He will bring restoration ultimately to us. Sometimes there's a longing in every heart that says, God just comes with a wrecking crew to destroy it all. God, can you just get rid of my terrible circumstances? I'm overwhelmed and I'm depressed and I'm anxious. God, remove me from the place that I'm in. God, change the place that I'm in. And, and, and God, just get me out of this. Bail me out of this situation. And he says to us, in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of your fallenness, I will restore. I will make all things new. And this helps us to understand what he's promising. This is a picture of a life in this world 
but made perfect. The existence, but renewed and enjoyed for all eternity. That's exactly how God surgically restores our lives. And one day, He will restore the world in the same way. He's taking down those weapons that were used, and He doesn't notice, burn them. He doesn't discard them. He repurposes them. He took their weapons of warfare, but you notice He didn't destroy their weapons. He repurposed them. That which has been used for death will be used for life. That which has been used to kill will be used to maintain and sustain new life. He doesn't discard the old. He keeps the old intact, but he repurposes it, transforms it into something that it couldn't have been without his transforming power. That's what he does with our lives. He takes all the things in our life that seem as though they will break down our life, and by his grace, he restores them. God can take all the things that in your life have brought violence, have brought injustice, have brought oppression, have brought guilt and fear and anxiety and plagued you, and he cannot take them out of your life. He actually can transform them into things that bring life into your life and to the lives of others. God wants to take your trial and turn it into a testimony. God wants to take your hurt and turn it into something that you can say, I thank God for I thank God for this. And God used it. And God's changed me through it. And God can take what has hurt you and use it to help somebody else. Not just transform your life, but transform somebody else's life. God cares. He doesn't just abandon and discard things and get rid of things. He renews them. And I thank God that he doesn't throw us in the trash heap. He makes us new. Father, we thank you for your grace today. God, we thank you for the opportunity today that we've had to gather. We thank you for your word today. God, help us to not so quickly desire that things would be discarded in our lives. We live in a disposable community. We live in a, in a community, in a culture that disposes relationships so quickly. When it's no longer convenient, when it is no longer easy, we just say, we'll just discard it. We'll just throw it away. We'll move on somewhere else. God, we're so thankful that that is not what you do. God, that while we were worthy of being discarded, that there was nothing that we could do in our own lives to redeem ourselves, while we were sinners, you died for us to make us new, to call us from darkness into life. Friend, today, perhaps, you have dealt with all the ugly of life. You've been hurt, you've experienced injustice and oppression, and you have even yourself, because of the culture and the world that you've lived in, you've been hurt, and so you've hurt other people. There's guilt and shame, mistakes and sins, and things that you struggle with. And today you may be saying, I don't know that God can help me. I don't know if peace is possible in my life. Friend, can I tell you that it is possible? Not because I'm the one making the promise today. I, I've not kept my word, but I can tell you today and point you to the promise maker who have always, has always been a promise keeper. That God himself promises to you that he can make your life new today. If there's something between you and God, if there's a reason why, you'd say, I'm cold in my heart. I'm continuing in sins that... I wish I could break in my life and patterns. I've been hurt in my family. I've been hurt by my friends. I've been hurt by people in this world. And so I'll never trust anybody again, especially not church people. Maybe today what you could say is, God, I'll trust you. God, I'll trust you because you've never left me. You've never forsaken me. God, while I've sinned against you, you've never sinned against me. And God, I want to have that peace that you promise the restoration that yes can come only through rebuke first correction first God I'm a sinner and while I've tried to do good in my life I've failed and God it's not my performance that I'm putting faith in today but in what you've done for me if you put your faith and trust in Jesus today friend he'll never fail you he will satisfy you 
And He calls you today. Can you hear His voice? Come to me, He says. Come to this mountain, this place of my presence, this place of my power and peace. Would you come? You have nothing to bring, but will you come empty-handed so I can fill it? Would you come so that I can provide and protect? Come with nothing, but gain everything. Leave behind what you have, because you have nothing to bring to me, but I have everything to give to you. And he says, come. He says, that's me today. I need to come to him. Would you, by faith today, just cry out to him, God, I'm a sinner. Would you please forgive me? Would you please save me? Would you make me your child? Would you give me your peace? And in trusting in him, friend, he will never fail you. He will never forsake you. Would you come, friend? Would you come, you that are hurting and and need help, you that are broken and need to be restored, would you come to him now even in this moment? Would you give your heart to him? Would you place your hand in his? Would you say, thank you, God, for being faithful when I was unfaithful? God, would you give peace to those that need it today? Maybe you're a Christian today and you've fallen and failed and you say, he doesn't want to hear from me. Friend, I, I guarantee you, You're his child. He wants to hear your voice. He loves you and he's calling you back. You may be prodigal, but he's a father waiting on the porch to receive you. And he wants you to come back home. Would you come home to him today? Would you come to that place where you'd humble yourself and say, God, would you restore to me joy in my salvation? Would you help me to stop looking to things in this world and objects and activities and other people to bring me the peace that only you can bring. God, would you help me to trust in you? Restore my faith today. Maybe that's you who needed that help today. May we all worship him, the one who is the promise maker and the promise keeper forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand together, church family.